Welcome, everybody. Sorry, sorry to rush you. We're a little bit behind time. So, um, so a very warm welcome to this um, plenary, Lessons from the Bali Past. Um, and so we've got an august panel here, and they're going to look at aspects of the development of Bali as an organisation, and I think give their professional and personal perspectives on current uh, context and future developments and opportunities. I think it should be a really interesting session. Um, we are quite tight for time. Each panel member is going to speak just for five or six minutes, which will hopefully leave us with 10 minutes for a more open discussion at the end. And we do have to um, finish the session a, a bit before half past five, 5.20 or 5.25. So, I'm not going to, I'm sure you've all read in the programme um, the bio data of our panels. I'm very pleased to introduce them today. Andy, uh, Olwyn, Maggie and Ian. Andy, Julia, Olwyn, Alexander, Maggie, Charles and Ian Bruce. Many of you here know them already or have worked with them. Uh, they've all been involved directly in the development and running of Barleap and or in pedagogy and research and working very closely with Bali members um, and SIGs. Um, and as you will have seen, they've all taught, researched and published extensively in various areas of EAP-related work and applied linguistics. I mean, their the list of publications is daunting. So, very happy to have them here. And without further ado, I'd like to hand over to our first panel member, Andy. Okay then, five, five minutes to tell you what I think um, Balip has done in the past, where it is now, and what it should do for the future. You might know that Balip has developed from something called Selmus in 1974. Selmus was the special English language materials for overseas university students. And then over the years, it has developed and various things have happened. Balip came about in 1989. It changed its name to the Global Forum for EAP Practitioners. And this is where we are now. These are the priorities I think Balip and Balip members should have. Um, starting with language. Selmus, Balip, the one word that they share is E, is English. And I think the main priority of Bali should be the English language. I think people sometimes forget that and people go off and do other things. But I think that is what the priority has been and should continue to be. Balip's USP is what the marketing people would like to say. I'm not saying that we shouldn't be concentrating on critical thinking, on internationalization and things like that, but there are other organizations that do that and I think Balip should concentrate on the linguistic element of all those. You might know the Reading Journal in form. You might know the Leicester Journal about the international student experience. You might know the LDHEN forum. A lot of organizations that deal with aspects of studying. I think if Balip doesn't concentrate on language, nobody will. So I think Balip should keep that concentration on language. This is my view of language. It's a systemic functional view of language, starting at the outside from genre and moving in. I didn't know Sheena was going to be in the audience, but uh, Nessie and Gardner's book on genre develops these primary purposes and these 13 genre families that I think is a good starting point. Don't want to criticize these, but I think we might be moving away from these simplistic 13 categories. I meet students now who need to write combined genres. They'll need to do methodolo methodological recounts with a reflection on. So I think we need to bear these in mind, but be careful about exactly what our students need to do. We want to know exactly what our students need to do. So that means we need to continue to do research, linguistic research. As, as Ian points out, one important aspect of Bali, of EAP and ESP has always been research. Continuing to do research to, kind, to find the kind of language that our students need. 
It's changing year by year with technology, with other developments. Um, Bali has inv invested very much in that with the rest test meetings, and I think that is good and needs to continue. I think research is essential for EAP. Um, there are some good textbooks, but the textbooks can never know exactly what your students will need in a particular context. So we need to keep doing the research. This might not mean research funding, it might not mean publications, it might not mean PhDs, but it means a certain amount of practitioner research that we cannot do our job without. And I think Bali needs to continue to develop this. How do we do that research? We need to collaborate with people from other disciplines, other departments. We need to work with them and find out. Um, some of you will know the Bali PIMS during the last few years. Some of the PIMS that have been run have included these studies. And I think this is good and it needs to continue. We need to continue working with dentists, working with financial managers, working with accountants and things like that to find out really what is going on in the academic world out there. It's never ending, it will never finish, because subjects are developing, genres are developing all the time, I think. PIMS, I like the PIMS. Um, when I first went to a Bali conference, there were 20 people sitting around the table. Conferences have developed to 400 people. The PIMS, when I first started working with the PIMS, there were 20 people sitting around the table. Now there are, how many, Sarah? 100, 150 people at the PIM. Do we need something smaller under the auspices of Bali? Maybe, but the kind of um, things that we do with PIMS are essential, I think. Integration, as I've said many times, the more that we can collaborate and integrate our teaching with other subjects, I think is essential, and Bali keep, should keep doing whatever it can to keep that going. Some of the best experiences of my life have been team teaching with accountants with engineers, and um, I think it's something that gets e easier as you get older, when you become more aware of what you know and what you don't know, and you feel that you don't need to always be the expert. Um, working with an accountant, I did for about five years, which I, I learned a lot from that. Um, Mike Beacon in Sheffield, some of you will know him if you're in the Sheffield area, at the first PIM, the first professional interest meeting in 1993. This is what he said Bali should be doing. And I wonder, 93, 2003, 20-some years later, how well Bali has done. What do you think? Are some of those still on the agenda? Does Bali still need to investigate? Some of those are not. What do you think? I'll leave you with that. Thank you. Hello everybody, I'm Owen Alexander and um, I've probably been coming to these kinds of meetings, conferences and PIMs for about 25 years now and they've been absolutely fundamental to my own professional development so that's the kind of thing that I'm going to be talking about. I'm very grateful to Bali because I don't have the opportunity within my own institution to develop professionally in the area of EAP so everything I've done has had to be um, my responsibility to get out and, um, and meet people. Um, I'm thinking about developing as an EAP teacher um, and the sorts of things that you personally have to do. You have to take responsibility for your own professional development. So what that means is that you don't ever say to yourself, well, I know how to do this, I'm really comfortable now, um, I'm, in, I'm in my comfort zone. You should always be seeking challenges and working at the edge of your competence. It's a really good idea to come out of teaching, uh, out of a classroom thinking, why didn't that go so well or as well as I expected? What else could I do? And I think it's, it's so important to be constantly reflecting like that. And what that means, um, and I've seen some reflection that's terribly unreflective because it simply reflects in a circle. What do I know? How, why didn't that go well in terms of what I know? So it's not possible to reflect unless you have some outside sources and I think that these kinds of meetings and some of the other things I'm going to talk about, statements of competence, reading and research relating to your practice which is really um, important 
and exploring communities of practice in your institution. These are all ways which I've managed to develop as a, an EAP practitioner, and I just want to mention some of them in a little bit of detail now. So um, I started working um, on the working party that drew up this list of competencies starting in about 2004-05 as a result of a PIM at Essex on EAP teacher development. And I think the really important thing about this framework is this is the key message from it, that an EAP practitioner recognises the importance of applying to their practice the standards expected of their own students and other academics at um, their institution while engaging individually, collaboratively in continuing professional development, research and scholarship. So that, that's a tall order, but that's the message of the competency framework. It's aspirational, it's there for you to measure yourself against and think about areas that you might want to reflect on your practice. And then I love this particular slide from Amy Choi. It's about how you become an expert practitioner. And it, it involves linking theory to practice. It involves practicalizing theory and theorizing practice. So what does that actually mean? When you practicalise theory, you take something and think about what does this actually mean in my classroom. When you theorise practice, you make explicit the tacit knowledge that you have as an experienced practitioner, and you look for explanations in the theory to see if that's chiming with the kinds of things you're thinking. So the way that that sort of thing happens is working at the edge of your competence, you need to recognise a gap in your knowledge or practice, and the theory and research findings, which you have to be reading, so you have to read, somehow strike a chord in order to fill that gap, and then you've got to recognise the validity of it for your teaching, and that might be in a light bulb moment, but it might just be a very slow, gradual build-up over the lifetime of your teaching. And then the other thing that I've certainly benefited from, and this is what Andy was saying as well, is this exploring communities of practice. So that requires you to become what's called an interactional expert. You're not a physicist, you can't contribute to the physics community, but you can talk the physics talk. Because you've got to make your students understand how to talk the physics talk once they get into their um, department. So your ability then becomes more generic. You don't have to talk about physics and know about physics, but you do have to understand as an educated non-specialist how it's reasonable to talk in academic environments, and you have to have the ability to reflect and think about the kinds of thing that's happening. I guess um, those are my two, uh, the, the sources that I've referred to, and perhaps I'll just leave you with the other thing that I've found really useful in my development is not staying too close to the EAP research. Get out a bit more. Read about the um, ideas about engagement, read about ideas about expertise which are written by other people in other areas. I've actually found new scientists to be a really great source of new ideas about what people are thinking and that's where I got the ideas about, from Collins and Evans about rethinking expertise. Good. Hello everyone. When I was asked to, to talk on this panel, um, the first thing I thought was, oops, I need some data. And as a lot of you will know, I'm a corpus linguist with my other hat on. So, of course, what I had to do was to go away and build a little corpus. So I'll tell you about that in a moment. Um, and, and my question was, what have we been doing for the last 30 years? Okay? Um, but then once I'd got the corpus, what I discovered was that actually it raised more questions than it gave me answers. So I'm afraid I'm ducking out of this a bit, and I'm going to give you, um, I think it's about five questions, but hopefully they might start you thinking. And I think my answers to these questions will probably be very different from the answers of all the individuals in the room. Okay, so uh, that was the corpus. It was a corpus of the titles of proceedings published in Bali, uh, sorry, of titles of papers published in Bali Proceedings over those dates. Uh, very small corpus, um, but 221 paper titles. Okay, so the first thing I wanted to know is, okay, what's been happening on the skills front? 
Okay. Now, uh, probably like a lot of you, I thought, yeah, yeah, writing will come out at the top, but I was utterly astounded by just how much more frequent it was than any of the other, uh, uh, any of the, uh, than the other three skills. Okay. And the question really is, I sat there going, is this the right balance? And that question is actually still turning over in my mind. And I, I think it's one that we perhaps need to ask. Okay, so um, what was, oh, I should say in getting these, um, in getting these numbers, um, what I'm doing is not just looking at the word writing, I'm looking at the word write, and then all the, um, all the, all the um, not just the root writing, but write, writer, writes, wrote, and so on, okay. And the same goes for the other ones, okay. And then I'm looking at the, at the word counts and taking in um, other uh, words that might indicate writers. And these are the number of papers that mention writing, okay, or, and the other things. Okay, so my question was, my second question was, okay, um, Andy was uh, talking about language and how important it is, and it's something I'm very interested in. So, uh, I wanted to know about language and what aspects of language we were, we've actually been um, writing about. Um, now, I was interested to see that language and linguist and those words came up right at the top. But then again, the question is, is this the right balance? Look at grammar and phraseology, particularly, right down at the bottom. Should we perhaps, I mean, I would argue, um, be thinking a little bit more about phraseology? Okay. Um, so, uh, the next one I asked myself was, Okay, let's just uh, look at the topics. And this was taken from looking at the word frequencies. And I thought this was particularly interesting because we had three um, criticality culture, including cultural and um, other connected words. Genre came up. Um, and then I wanted to check out study skills because I know that this was something that was um, uh, very much a focus earlier in um, Bali, uh, in, in earlier incarnations of Bali. And interestingly, there is very, very little, there's very, very little being published um, on study skills. So that's including things like note taking, note making, noting, and so on. Okay. Um, and then I have to ask myself, are these the most important topics? And, well, answering from my point of view as a teacher of postgrads um, at Oxford, um, genre, yes, okay. Um, culture, mm, I'm, I'm not sure. Criticality, probably not. Okay, so if you've got in to do um, a PhD at Oxford, you probably don't need training in critical thinking, okay? However, it's a completely different answer to that question if you're teaching undergraduates, okay? Um, okay, and then again, looking at, looking down my word list, then what issues have we been focusing on? And this, again, I found incredibly interesting. I, I, um, because uh, where I work in Oxford, I don't have to do any assessments. Okay, so I, I teach courses that are non-assessed. So it was very interesting to me that assessment came so high up the list. Okay, so we've obviously been, over the last years, we've been very, very interested in assessment. Um, I was, however, very pleased to see lots and lots on technology, because I think that's one of the future, the really important future directions and something we have to, uh, we have to uh, not just live with, but incorporate and use. Um, then, specificity. Okay, and I think this speaks to the EGAP, ESAP debate. Okay, so that's still live and going on. And then, uh, lastly, precessional. And interestingly, incessional. Uh, there were very, very few papers on in, on incessional that mentioned it in the title. Um, so again, how does this affect me? Well, um, assessment. Um, I'm sure is really important if that's what you have to do. I don't. Technology, yes, really important for me. Specificity, yes, something that I've also had to struggle with. Um, Precessional, um, 
we do have one at Oxford, I don't teach on it, and so again, that's not of interest to me. But uh, for you guys, are these the most important issues? Okay, and again, it's throwing really that question back at you. Okay, so uh, this is my last slide, and my last slide basically takes the top four areas from the slides that I've shown you already. Okay, interestingly, writing still outranks the other, uh, top, th the other top three, okay? Um, followed by assessment, okay? Followed by technology and followed by language. Now, I think uh, what's good about this is that there does seem to be this widespread of, um, of content within papers that have been published in Bali proceedings, okay? Um, but that's what's been happening over the last, since, well, since 1989 to uh, 2015, okay? And they, those were the proceedings that I had access to. Um, but are these the most important topics now, okay? Uh, and again, I think each one of you is going to have uh, a slightly different take on that question. And Ultimately, what I would, I just want to finish by saying is underlining what Alwyn just said. I think um, what I've tried to show you in this presentation is basically, let's keep questioning our practice, okay? And I hope my questions have led to uh, some questions for you as well. Okay, thank you. I thank you, Jean, for inviting me also to participate in this panel. <clears throat> um, my name's Ian Bruce. I'm from New Zealand. I teach at a university there, so my connections with Bali have been a bit more distant than um, these people. Um, my contacts have been mainly through the biennial conferences, the online discussion list, and as a reviewer, and sometimes contributor to the journal, um, the Journal of English for Academic Purposes. Um, so the remit for this panel was um, to, to think about the contributions of Bali from the past and to make some suggestions about the future. So I just want to say three things about each. Um, I think Bali has made three important contributions to the field. And the first is stability and continuity. Um, when you think about the activities of Bali, it's provided a framework, I believe, for a discourse community to develop, and especially in the UK and to some extent abroad. Um, there's the biennial conferences, the professional issues meetings, the research and training event series, the, the different working groups, the projects that it's fostered, the accreditation scheme, the TEEP competency framework, the fellowship scheme and the journal, which began in 2002. So Bali's been pretty active by the, by the measure of most uh, of this type of organisation. Second contribution, I think, <coughs> which Bali has made is the connection um, has always maintain a connection between theory and research. You go to so many um, conferences about language teaching or, or writing conferences, and um, some are strong on one side and, and some are much more practice-based, but there's always a good balance and there's a kind of seamlessness when you look through the, the Bali conference programs, and there's an openness to expanding um, the knowledge base informed by theory and research, and I find that very encouraging and the third, and I think the, probably the most important um, contribution from the past of Bali is, a, is intellectual. There's a conceptual legacy that's been passed on by earlier members of Bali. There's some fundamental concepts of EAP, which really um, originate from the, the early, earlier members of this organisation and their meetings. The, the first one's the needs analysis, the idea of engaging the subject disciplines relating student need to course development, I think is um, something that um, is, is, uh, is pretty um, fundamental from the beginning and it's something we need to maintain. There's always been a focus on text and discourse and a willingness to engage with linguistic research. And many other writing communities shy away from this. And I'm not going to name any, but um, what is really good about the, the Bali community is that um, there's a real interest in, in linguistic theory. There's a lot of text, research on text and, and discourse in text. And a close connect, examples are the close connections with systemic functional linguistics and the ESP genre theories. 
As a result, you get the focus on genre-based pedagogy with holistic objectives and analytic syllabus. And I think this is absolutely fundamental to what we're trying to achieve when we're, we're teaching EAP courses. There's another legacy concept which I think has got a bit forgotten and I want to kind of um, draw people's attention to today and that's something that the late Alan Waters and Mary Waters called study competence as opposed to study skills. I think it's a really, uh, I think it connects very closely with the ideas of genre theory. I think it, they wrote about it in the early 2000s and before that I think it's got a bit lost and I think we need to return to it. And so these I see as very fundamental bedrock concepts from EAP that have been refined and been passed down through the Bali community. The future, I'd just like, as I said, make three points. The first one is maintain the continuity. I think Bali should maintain its continuity in terms of its conferences, activities, its PIMs, its working groups. My only regret is I'm, we're so far away and sometimes feel a bit disconnected from the, um, the more regular meetings that you have. The second recommendation for the future, and I haven't colluded with um, Nigel at all on these last two, um, is a greater fo focus on the global. There needs to be more international connect connections in the future. Um, at an organisational level, I'd like, um, I, I think it would be really good to see um, combined conferences, international conferences, with Bali, with other organisations. and I. I know Maxine Gilray, when she was as chair, has been very active in forging these kinds of links. I think there could be international conferences, say, um, every four years, a bit like ILA, in the three main regions where, where EAP is most actively taught, which would be the UK and Europe, um, the Middle East and the Gulf, and the Asia-Pacific region. Um, we have a group at this conference from the China EAP Association and who are presenting a symposium. I think that's a great step in this direction. I think we need to really encourage and, and foster these kinds of links and um, this focus on the global much more. And my final point about the future is developing a po public policy voice. Um, the third, um, particularly developing a voice on issues which vitally affect higher education, and particularly EAP. I think there need to be policies articula articulated around issues such as privatisation and the outsourcing of EAP provision, um, EAP practitioners' careers and working lives, working conditions, and particularly uh, policies around support for practitioners undertaking scholarship and research. Um, the policy area is important because these larger issues are increasingly affecting our day-to-day -day EAP practice and working lives. For example, in 2007, at the Balik Conference at Durham, I recall Peter Grundy um, making a um, very concerned um, plea to the conference about um, impending privatisations which were going on in the UK at that time. And I thought, well, it's never going to happen to us. I mean, we're so, so remote and we're so small none of the, the big players will come to our part of the world, um, how wrong I was. And um, we've all been, uh, it's, it's happened um, um, to even where I work. So this is an area is really important, as I said, it affects our practice, it affects our working lives. Um, public policy issues could be around the issues of um, proof, universities' policies on proofreading and things that, like Nigel was talking as well. Um, I think we should have a voice on these issues more, um, not defocusing from practice, but supporting practice with this. I think the public policy voice has to be developed through collaborations with other higher education organisations. So these are my personal thoughts anyway, but now I think it's important to hear your views about these things. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. It's really interesting from everybody. So that we've got 10 minutes now for a, a more open discussion and questions to the panel and sharing knowledge and um, thoughts. Um, so is there anybody who would like to ask the panel a question or has a comment or thought? Give them time. I had one. Yes. Sorry, there's a microphone coming. If you could just, sorry, thank you. Could you repeat it? Thank you. 
Hi. Um, thank you. That was really interesting. I'd like to ask Ian a question, if that's possible. Um, so could you say a little bit more about the um, sort of global ambitions that you, that you have? Because I think that's really important, really interesting. Well, um, and this idea yeah. you know, of connecting, collaborating. More. There is, um, there's always been interest in the ESP in Southeast Asia. There's, there's, there's a lot of, there's quite a community there, but they're a bit um, isolated. In China, there's a big move from college English to EAP, but they're very much working on defining what EAP is. Um, they draw, um, I was at the China EAP conference, um, I gave a plenary there last year, and it was very evident from all of the, the, the talks that they're really um, grappling with relating to EAP to their own context, and a lot of you people were cited, I have to say, at that, um, at that conference. I think we... I think that there's, there's, a, there's a stable, long-standing community here, and I think you have a lot to offer mm. at, to other places, and um, I think that um, the, a lot, well, I think other places benefit, to be quite honest, by, by, by having these kinds of conferences. I mean, um, you look at the, the list of titles at this conference, and, and they're impressive of, of the presentations, and there's some interesting stuff going on here, which you don't find very often, and I just think that needs to be opened up to the world a bit more. That, that would be my feeling. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, Maxine? Can I just say we are having our first global conference in China? Oh. Great. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> Can you say that through a microphone, please, Maxine? Yes, <laughs> we need it. <coughs> in Chinese. <laughs> I had one about any, um, a, f a colleague asked me in the coffee break, this idea of um, scholarship and in improving your own research profile, could the panel suggest any ways of doing that if they're on a teaching contract that's like 21, 22 hours a week, you know, and they've yeah. any ways or things they could say to their managers that might help them? It is a bit of a vicious circle, isn't it? That it is, yeah. You somehow have got to get into that circle. And nobody's going to fund you or give you money to do research if you've never done any. Yes. So, um, so somehow you've got to mm. suffer for a bit, I think, and produce something which will then mean you'll get money yeah. or um, fewer teaching hours to do it. But I, I don't know how you break in yeah, into you... that circle. Mm. Well, I think one way to break in is collaboration. Mm. Um, I had a nice, fruitful collaboration with a lecturer in logistics and... Um, you know, we were able to do a piece of research together <clears throat> because she was interested in the incessional work that I was doing. Um, I do think that, you, unfortunately, you have to do it in your own time. It's not good enough to say, well, I haven't got funding and it's not in my workload model and I've got a family and two kids and I'm, I work nine to five. That, that isn't how I developed professionally. I really wanted to do this kind of stuff and I was able to make time in my personal life to focus on it. And sadly, you, you do have to have that sort of orientation, I think. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. Um, probably the, well, the way I got into research was by doing research um, for my PhD, um, and I didn't get any funding um, for that, although at that stage, um, Birmingham University had a very generous um, way of uh, a, a very generous sort of fee discounts for part-time students. I'm not sure they do anymore. But there are online, there are MOOCs that you can follow which will help you generate ideas for research and there are also online um, courses that you can do uh, to sort of help ease yourself gently into research. And then I think what's very important is identifying what you are really interested in, in finding out about. Um, so rather than sort of taking on someone else's project, you've got to have the passion to want to know uh, what the answer is to your research questions. Um, and it can take, I think, a long time to find something that drives you sufficiently so that you are prepared to give up your weekends, your 
evenings and so on and so forth. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm going to offer an answer, and for some people who were at the um, Sheffield PIM quite a while ago, it's a repeat, but um, looking across, I think Maggie's way of looking across um, previous um, proceedings was interesting, but when you go to PIMS a lot, you see that topics keep coming up again and again, which means that across the Bollard community, there are a lot of people who have a shared interest. And when you're trying to do research, you often need a large population of students or a large population of data. And that it's often difficult for one person to pull it together. And so I think that one thing that, that, that the notion of community in Bali is that if we think about science, science papers often have, you know, 5, 10, 20 authors on them. There's nothing to say that a researcher has to try to find their own way and do it all by themselves. And I think that when you're looking at, when you're attending conferences and when you're going to PIMS, look for people who have a shared interest and start to find a community of people where you can do research together. And I think, I know the way I work, that it's, it's a lot easier to stay motivated when there's somebody else that you've got to, whose expectations you need to meet um, and you don't want to let other people down. So I would say, don't think about it as a single um, solo operation, but find people to communicate with and share and develop research projects. Thank you, Diane. Claire, did you? Hello there, I'm, uh, I'm uh, Claire Furno. I've just been marking undergraduate, BA undergraduate work. And every time I do that, I realize what a need there is for EAP for our own students. Uh, and I just wonder, whether we are happy for this divide to continue between EAP for international students and the work we do in our pre-sessional courses and our in-sessional and the fact that study skills is in the library uh, for, for the home students because it seems to me actually it's absolutely crucial. That's my first point. My second point is, is writing for the 21st century, should it still be the main skill that we focus on? But answer either of those or neither. Yep. Can I say something in response? Oh, yes, certainly. Oh, sorry, go on. Just to say, most of the students I teach these days are home students. Mm. Um, who knows what their first language is, but they're home students. A lot of undergraduate and pre undergraduate HND, if you're in this country, you know HND yeah. students. And I don't find their needs very different from the international students I've worked with over the last 20, 30 years. Yes, I think I would second that. I would be quite happy to have um, groups of um, uh, so-called English native speakers, native speakers of English together with um, international students. I think it would work very well, in fact, uh, in my context. No, we don't. Uh, we've, we've started... Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, uh, and partly it's the way the institution, certainly at Oxford, the way the institutions within which we work was set up. Mm -hmm. So ours was set up to teach foreign languages and then along came English as a foreign language. So yes, no, it's, it, it's just, it, we, it, needs, it needs institutional change um, yeah. before you can do it. So, and so just to finish, the last year, um, I've been brought out to work with our skills at library to, we develop, we run programs now for all students and it's very interesting and they're working out quite well we put out pens at first but they're actually on tables together talking about to, to reduce these silos and it's early days but it's really really useful if i could just pick up on the writing yeah i still think it is probably the most important skill but i am slightly uh worried that the other skills are being totally pushed out in the way that that seemed to suggest. Maybe that's not a true picture, okay, but I think it should at least give us pause for thought, okay. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like yes. to make a comment. My name is Brian Paltridge from the University of Sydney. You're talking about, you know, EAP teachers being able to carry out research. I don't know if you know, but there's a very successful project that Anne Burns has been running in Australia. Uh, and she does it as an action research project, mm -hmm. and she gets funding, I think from Cambridge Assessment and somebody else, and she, um, 
what they do is they give money to the institutions to buy the teachers' time out, because this is when they say, we can't afford to let you off your classes. And so they do action research projects, uh, investigating their own practice, and then they go to like the English Australia Conference and present it. They come to an, an event that we have. Uh, and I've been to those presentations they're given. It's very exciting, and it really changes the whole sort of attitude towards research, to the point that, you know, in the last round of new appointments of continuing positions in the Language Centre, everyone that got a job had a PhD or was doing one. So that's quite a shift around. And so, you know, the people in the institution get seen very differently by the institution. Now, the head of that Language Centre has been poached by NIAS, the National English Accreditation Association of Australia, similar to what the Bali accreditation thing is doing. So that's going to filter up. So it's really quite inspiring to see how that's happened. So maybe if someone knows Anne and can talk to her about how this has worked, I think it's a very successful sort of approach because it's actually at no cost to the institution, yes. which is really the yes. main bother. Yes. And it really creates quite a different environment. So it's maybe something someone might like to look at. Thank you. Yeah, we will do, yeah. Can you? Yes, thank you. Yes, would you like to? Oh. Sarah. Yeah. Um, I've just got a question following on from what Maggie was saying and indeed the last speaker. I, I wasn't quite sure about your question about whether it was an emphasis on teaching that people are presenting on writing or, and publishing on writing. Um, I wonder whether actually it's just easier to do small-scale research, which is probably what most of us are able to do, with something tangible like writing. So I don't, I'm not sure whether that question is right, that it's what we're teaching most. But I think perhaps one of our issues is that we don't have much time to research and we don't often have much support to research. So maybe perhaps a role for Bardi going forward is to support more efforts to research skills such as listening, reading, and speaking, and, and as Diane said, join together um, so that we have more output about it. But I, I think it's about what people research and, rather than what they're teaching. Yes. Um, when I was doing this, I, I haven't obviously got the context of the way these words are being used. So it could have easily been teaching writing, or it could have been um, analysis of the written product, or pretty much anything else. Okay, so yeah, in a sense, I was using that simply as a way in to generate questions or insights. Okay, um, sorry, uh, your second point, yes, is absolutely valid. I think, I mean, we all we all mark things, and therefore we have um, sometimes electronic products available to us, or written products um, on paper. And so therefore we always have, should we wish to use it, and if we get the student's permission, um, a, a data set. <laughs> um, whereas capturing, well, uh, you know, if you've got your pile of essays, like Claire was talking about, if you've got permission to use them, then you've got, um, you've, you've, you've got a set of data and you can then start examining it and asking the questions you're interested in and therefore it is easier. Um, whereas capturing the spoken word is very much more complicated and also I think researching things like listening are again very much more complicated. So yes, I think you're absolutely right. There's also the other issue which is it may be, e maybe the people who are if, if what they're doing is teaching writing and analyzing writing, maybe they themselves are more likely to write it up. Hmm. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> okay, <coughs> thank you. Do you want to finish? Um, okay. Yes, we'll have to stop there, I'm afraid. Hopefully we'll continue these conversations throughout the conference. So I'd like to thank our panel.